Okay, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone, for those in the U.S., and good afternoon to everyone in the U.K. Uh, welcome to the Heart BDTK Technical Conference. Uh, today, we have one presentation, which will be about uh, Aztec updates. Uh, we are scheduled uh, to end at the latest 9 a.m. Pacific time, and this presentation will be recorded and accessible online uh, once we've processed it. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type it in the message box. And also, please mute your mic during the presentation to prevent any background noises. Um, okay, so today, Brian and I uh, will be giving a few updates regarding our overall progress of Aztec. Uh, specifically, we'll highlight uh, some of the research and development uh, that we're working uh, for Aztec. <clears throat> So today we'll start off with a very quick overview of what ASEC is, and then I'll elaborate on the new phase of development. Um, Brian and I will then go over uh, the different ongoing research projects uh, uh, to improve Aztec, and we'll end our presentation with an update about our closed uh, beta release. Okay, so. Uh, Aztec aims to provide users with a global biomedical resource discovery knowledge base to search a diverse array of tools. Uh, the resource, resources indexed uh, include web services, uh, standalone software, publications, and large libraries composed of many interrelated functions. Um, Aztec uh, will ensure that software tools remain uh, findable in the long term. And one of the ways uh, we will do this is by routinely updating the metadata um, in the database. Okay, so um, here's uh, Aztec's main uh, interface, um, the the website. So we keep the design simple with you know just the search bar uh, in the home page, and uh, a user can type in their query to find the resource that they're looking for. And if the query is a resource's name or part of its name, it will show up in the auto suggest box uh, below the search bar. And after a user answers his or her search, uh, we, we we display a list of results based on the individual individual words in the query. So in this case, the query uh, is biological pathways. Um, in our current configuration of the search engine, the search identities identifies the uh, resources that have the query terms in the resource metadata. So if the resource metadata has both terms, biological and pathways, uh, they will be in the search results. Uh, the more time the query term appears in the resources metadata relative to the number of times the term appears in the whole collection, uh, the more relevant the resource is to the query and it'll show up um, first uh, in the results. Uh, this ranking algorithm is uh, the default algorithm used for Solar, which is the indexing platform we're using. Uh, in the future, we're looking to improve the ranking algorithm by incorporating user feedback, uh, maybe like statistics involving publication citations and other metrics. Um, and once a user finds uh, the resource that they're looking for, um, then they can click on the res on the result and come to this page, um, and it will show all the metadata that we have uh, for that resource. Okay, um, here's a quick overview of our uh, of Aztec system workflow. Uh, we've broken it down to three main steps. So the discover step involves gathering the resources from different uh, sources to populate Aztec's database. And we've built programs to automatically extract metadata from existing registries. Uh, we also set up a platform for users to manually enter uh, their metadata. And this platform allows them to submit new uh, you know, resource metadata, uh, edit existing metadata, or they can even save and edit uh, the metadata later. Uh, in the review step, uh, the resources extracted by our programs 
uh, and submitted by our users are reviewed for accuracy and quality. Um, our reviewers uh, will ensure that the resource metadata is complete before it is published uh, to the public uh, ASTEC database. And the, in the publish step, uh, we focus on uh, making all the resource meta, metadata uh, reviewed by our reviewers uh, to be available to the public. And this step includes creating and maintaining the web user interface, as well as maintaining the databases that uh, store the metadata. Uh, currently, ASEC database uh, includes resources from seven different sources. Uh, in the table, I've listed the sources and the number of resources from each source. Uh, I'd like to highlight that we have uh, about 480 user submissions. Um, and in addition, our reviewers have curated over 100 resources from the BDTK community, uh, including the tools uh, uh, within the Heart BDTK Center. And uh, since Aztec, Aztec's uh, inception last year, we've uh, gathered over 9,000 resources. Um, yeah, so I'd like to go back to this graphic again to show how uh, kind of sparse the metadata is for the resources in Aztec's database. Um, so many of the registries uh, that we've extracted the resources uh, from uh, do not have much metadata for these tools. Um, I mean, most tools have a few links, a short description, maybe some tags and uh, the authors, uh, but that's pretty much it. Um, so what we, what we what we can do is manually curate and enrich the metadata for you know all nine thousand tools in our database, but that requires um, you know some informatics expertise and a huge team of uh, curators. Um, so, and I guess in, in the past few months, uh, our team of curators uh, have been enriching the metadata in ASIC database and. What our teams notice is that a lot of information can be found in the tool's publication. Um, so things like authors, institutions, links, and funding uh, can all be found in the paper. And by reading the paper, you can determine the type of resource. Uh, it is um, the, the biological domain it belongs to, and sometimes the input and output uh, files for the resource. Um, so th there are some fields that can be easily extracted uh, from the paper with just a simple text extraction program. And then fields that require more you know, human intelligence uh, will most likely require more sophisticated text mining and mach machine learning technologies to, class to classify and determine their values. Um, so now we're moving on to our next phase in which we're using uh, text mining techniques to populate the metadata for uh, our resources. Um, and we'll start with the 9,000 tools that we currently have in our database. <clears throat> so uh, we've identified some, some of the tools that are, are out there that can help us extract metadata about a particular resource. Um, the first one is GROBID, uh, which stands for Generation of Bibliographic data. Uh, GroBid is a machine learning library for extracting, parsing, and restructuring uh, raw documents such as you know PDFs uh, into structured documents with a particular focus on technical and scientific publications. Um, and the the uh, extracted information is listed uh, in the slide. So GroBid can extract uh, fields like name, description, authors, affiliations. Uh, funding sources, tags, uh, links, and sometimes even the, the license. Um, there are also there's also the GitHub API, which gives us uh, more technical information about uh, a resources development, uh, including like programming languages, uh, license, uh, maintainers, and the versions. And uh, both the PubMed and Crossref APIs provide a way to find other publications uh, related to the resource.
Uh, here's a comparison of the metadata extracted uh, from uh, one of the uh, registry, uh, registries uh, versus a text mining approach. Um, so a lot of the fields uh, can be extracted using the tools that I've mentioned uh, in the slide before. And some fields will need multiple technologies to verify and ensure the, the values are accurate. Um, so in this table, I've uh, bolded the fields that require uh, technologies um, that will need to be refined or customized for our particular use. Um, and I'll be going over some of those technologies in the next uh, few slides. Um, and uh, here, here are more of the metadata fields. Um, some of the some of these customized tools like the keywords tool, the funding extraction tool, and the domain classifier uh, are currently being uh, developed uh, te and tested uh, by some of the, our researchers at the uh, computer science department at UCLA. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'll be going uh, over some of the details uh, of the research that we're working on, uh, starting with the text summarization, uh, which lets us summarize a large body of text with just a few sentences. So uh, before we, uh, before a body of text can be processed by the computer, uh, it has to be broken down to a more simplified uh, list of words. So uh, all the operations performed on the text are preceded by this, this uh, text normalization process. Uh, so first uh, we uh, tokenize the text using uh, the Stanford tokenizer and the POS tagger. Um, each word is replaced with its lemma, uh, and uh, in linguistics, uh, lemma means uh, an abstract conceptual form of the word. And uh, also, uh, the stop words are removed, and stop words are basically the most common words in the English language. Um, and then each lemma is replaced with a representative um, of the set of similar lemmas uh, to which the, the lemma belongs to. Can you make that not full screen because uh, it's not sh showing up when it's full screen? The oh. graphic. Oh, no, 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 it's click clickable. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's an animation, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll go over a quick example of, uh, of how this tokenization uh, works. So, uh, the sentence RNA-seq technique has been demonstrated as a revolutionary means for exploring transcriptome because it provides deep coverage and base pair level resolution. So uh, in this case, um, uh, the word uh, has has been replaced by its lemma, which is have, and it is removed because uh, it is a stop word. So it's a very common uh, word uh, in the English language. Um, similarly, uh, uh, the word bin uh, has been replaced by its lemma, which is B, and it is also removed because it is a stop word. Um, and in this case, the, the word demonstrate is, is replaced by its lemma, demonstrate, uh, and then it's replaced by uh, an, with a representative lemma, in this case, present. So we do this to every word uh, in the sentence, and the result is just the list of words, RNAC, technique, pre present, revolutionary, way, research, transcriptome, provide deep coverage, base pair level result. So it's, it's not necessarily a sentence, but it extracts the, the more important uh, words, the, mo the most important words in the sentence. <clears throat> um, so I won't go into too much detail, but I'll give a quick and simplified overview of the technique to summarize uh, the text. So we use uh, this uh, text rank approach. Um, and basically we start with a complete graph where each sentence is a node in, in the graph and each edge is assigned a weight given by the similarity of the connected sentences. Um, Basically, uh, we use uh, something called the Jacquard similarity, um, 
which which is basically measured by taking the, the intersection of two sentences and dividing it by the union of those two sentences. So that's just a quick uh, overview of the Jacquard similarity. And then we use uh, an algorithm similar to the Google page rank algorithm um, to assign a, a rank to each sentence. Um, so the rank of each sentence depends on the rank of its uh, related sentences. And then the sentences with the highest rank are, are, are returned and pre preserving the order of appearance in the text. Um, and the same approach can be used to identify the, the most relevant words in the text. Uh, so we can use, use this approach to find tags uh, in the description. Um, and in this approach, nodes of the graph would be re represented by the distinct words, and the, the weight of each edge depends on the pair of words that occur together within a certain distance. <clears throat> um, so here's an example of uh, how the text summarization algorithm is used uh, for the Copa KV abstract. So, uh, you know, we give the abstract and the tool tokenizes all the words while maintaining the group of uh, words and sentences. And we apply the text rank algorithm to rank the, the seven sentences in the abstract. And the top two results uh, are returned, um, which is listed on the right. Uh, in general, it, it does a decent job of figuring out which sentences are important. Uh, the algorithm uh, return, returns a sentence that was most related to the other uh, sentences. So uh, in this case, uh, the the most important sentence uh, from this abstract would be, you know, we created cart cardiac organelloprotein analysis knowledge base, a centralized platform of high quality cardiac cardiac data, bioinformatics tools, and relevant cardiovascular phenotypes. So it identifies the keywords and uh, kind of figures out that a lot of the words in this sentence are related to the other uh, sentences and uh, this sentence sentence gives like the highest score out of all of them so it returns that as the most relevant <clears throat> um, the next uh, research uh, that I'll be talking about is the tool similarity so uh, tool similarity evaluation is used to uh, in order to suggest uh, other tools uh, to a user who is looking at a page of, of a specific tool. So, you know, in our ASIC uh, resource metadata page, on the side, they would say, you know, you may also be interested in, and it'll list out uh, tools that are similar to the, the resource that they're looking at. So similarity is uh, computed using uh, the textual dis description of tools and the, the text rank is, is, a combine, is combined with uh, an approach called uh, term frequency uh, inverse document frequency approach. Uh, and basically uh, the term frequency is the number of times a term occurs in a document or in our case uh, the description. And the inverse document frequency is uh, the factor incorporated uh, which diminishes the weight of a term that occurs very frequently in the document set and increases the weight of terms that occur rarely. So a lot of common words like, you know, the or be uh, will be will have a smaller inverse document frequency because it occurs a lot more frequently in the collection of uh, documents. Um, so uh, so that's a brief brief overview of the uh, TF IDF approach. Um, so for each tool, the, the 20 most relevant words uh, are identified um, and extracted from the description. Um, the, the term frequency metric is replaced uh, with the term rank metric, uh, and it's which is a combination of uh, inverse document frequency weighting scheme. Um, for for our future work, uh, we we hope to track uh, user clicks to improve the quality of suggested tools. So we'll keep track of the uh, number of clicks that a, a user makes 
um, to a certain tool to to kind of uh, increase the weight of uh, how uh, how popular the tool is. Um, and using this uh, tool similarity uh, approach, we are, we can also use this to uh, detect duplicate tools. Um, so basically, duplicate detection helps uh, helps us validate uh, new tools uh, entered by users, and in particular, to, uh, we're going to prevent the reinsertion of existing tools. Uh, in our case, high accuracy isn't necessarily mandatory. Um, where false, false positives are acceptable, but um, our system should uh, avoid false negatives. And high similarity of descriptions is uh, a signal of possible duplication. Um, and we can also use other heuristics, uh, such as you know if if a paper or if the resource has like the the same like source code URL um, as another tool, then most likely it's it's a duplicate. Hey, uh, this is uh, Brian. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, things we're working on currently uh, for Aztec. Um, one of our projects is to try to ensure we have really high quality metadata. Um, so as Vincent covered earlier, the uh, the Grobid system is really um, effective way to to extract metadata, um, but we might not necessarily have um, Publication uh, publications available for all tools, and we also want to just verify and double check the information that the Grubin extracts. So we have a lot of different other sources we can query. So um, to get authors, uh, we can check um, Crossref and and Orchid, um, and then for for the uh, programming language in addition to Grubin, we can also check um, check GitHub. Um, um, and we can we can try when we identify uh, metadata from from multiple sources, we can compare it and verify we have as much uh, matching metadata as possible um, to show that we have high quality metadata. And if we if we encounter any contradictory metadata, then that can be flagged and brought to the attention of our reviewers. Um, <clears throat> we're also working on uh, improving improving the search as much as possible. So we have um, uh, auto completion um, integrated, and uh, Vincent showed a screenshot of that earlier. Um, also, we're trying to uh, to implement as many synonyms as possible, uh, so that people can find relevant tools, even if they're not using the the precise term that's associated with. So we're using the mesh terms and the uh, EDEM ontology to uh, build those synonym lists. Um, and if somebody's searching for not necessarily something incredibly specific. But searching for just a broad term like proteomics, we want to um, return the the biggest, uh, most popular, most widely used tools in those fields. So um, we are going to weight the tools uh, based on things like metadata completeness and then uh, source repository metrics to tell us how popular the tool is and also how recently it's been updated, how actively the community is working on it, um, the number of citations with associated pub publication and then all metrics mentions of, of the tools in social media. Um, um, also, uh, in addition to uh, just getting metadata from uh, publications, we also want to be able to find uh, new tools uh, directly from the literature that have not been uh, mentioned in any of the uh, repositories like SourceForge that we're mining. Um, so we're developing a system to, to automatically classify all the articles of PubMed as being associated with tool releases or, or not associated with tool releases. Um, so uh, we're using a machine learning approach and the classification features we're looking at um, include title structure and punctuation, um, alternate word case, uh, so that would include you know, a word in all capitals um, in a sentence that's otherwise not in all capitals, or uh, a word with a camel case or an alternate case, something like that. Um, so some examples of, of, uh, of publication titles here, you can see the ProLucid title, the, the, the word ProLucid and also the word Sequest, uh, both, both stand out because Sequest is in all caps and ProLucid has an, has an alternating um, camel case. Um, also many tools fit, uh, share the same type of sentence structure punctu punctuation. So you have a, a short period of sentence followed by colon 
followed by the remainder of the title. Um, so we can look at the, the, the length of the, of the primary title before the colon and compare it to the length of the uh, subtitle after the colon. Um, one thing that we, we definitely notice is a lot of um, publications dealing with genes or particular molecules um, have a very similar structure and also very similar um, capitalization uh, trends as tool titles. So this LRP5, um, there's somebody who ha had no idea what LRP5 was. This might look like a, uh, a software tool. Um, so, you know, it, it's all capitals. It has a number included in the, in the name, which is something very common that you'll see in a, in a, in a software tool in the title. So we have to directly check these to see if, um, if they are their known genes or known molecules, something like that, so they can be discounted. Um, and in addition to that, we look at the presence and frequency of, of keywords and synonyms in the title and the abstract. Like, for example, this ProLucid one has a keyword algorithm um, in there. Uh, so using these features and using the neural network approach, we're trying to identify um, as, many, um, as many tools in, in the PubMed corpus as possible. Okay. Um, as I mentioned in our last presentation, um, we are uh, starting our, or we, we started our closed beta release uh, in June 20th um, to get uh, user feedback from the biomedical research community. Um, so uh, for, for, uh, for this past uh, few weeks and for this next month, uh, we're focusing our efforts on uh, proteomics resources uh, since uh, we, we are working with a lot of our proteomics researchers. Um, we we started our first round of beta testing with uh, some of our researchers at UCLA, uh, and what we did was uh, we let the the testers uh, navigate through the website, and we asked them questions about you know the design of the website, uh, and as well as like the search results, um, the, the aesthetics, um, and we gathered a lot of good feedback about like the you know, so placement of information about a resource. For example, you know, one of our testers uh, suggested that the URL should be on the on the on the website uh, for the resource, uh, or the URL for for the main website of a resource should be made more apparent and accessible, uh, because it's 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 not made very apparently apparent. So we should probably put it like right uh, on the front page when it first loads. Um, so most of the feed and the other feedback that we've gathered uh, was mostly for the search results. So my, while Aztec uh, does have uh, many of the popular proteomics tools in the database, uh, they don't uh, rank as high in the search results list. And we're currently working with testers to better annotate the tools and possibly populate the metadata for the proteomics uh, tools to boost their rankings. Um, and also one of our testers pointed out that it would be very useful to map out the workflows uh, of the resources. So for example, uh, to specify what types of files or data uh, the resource takes as input and output. And you know, that is one of our features that we're hoping to develop uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, and our development team is operating on an iterative uh, two-week release cycle. Uh, to fix any bugs and improve the application uh, based on the testers uh, feedback uh, and we'll most likely be inviting more beta testers with within our center uh, in, the, in the next uh, coming weeks uh, to get more uh, user feedback um, so that, that concludes uh, our presentation uh, thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions Okay, so there's a question in the, in the chat box. So, are there any are there resources from GitHub that could be of interest to include? Um, so I'm not I'm not totally sure if I if I understand this, but we do use the GitHub. Um, GitHub has a uh, an API, a REST API that you can use to query information about about users and repositories, um, which we are using to help populate our metadata. Um, so, for example, if you have a repository's uh, URL, you can query the API and you can get the programming language and you can get the, um, the, the contributors and the authors and you can get the short description of the tool, um, which we can use to, to build metadata. And then you can also get uh, the amount of activity 
uh, on the repositories. You can tell how often it was updated. So you can know if it's a recently, if it's an active tool. Uh, you can know how, how often it was forked. So you can know how many different people have been working on it. Um, that can give you a sense of how popular it is, which can be useful for, um, for waiting search results. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. This is Susan. I asked it early on before you had gotten to the GitHub part of your talk. So um, then you sort of self-answered it during your talk, which is great. I have to run, but this is really nice, and I look forward to further updates in July when we uh, NIH visits the, the site. Thank you, Susan. Absolutely. Thanks, Pepe. I hope you have a good meeting today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing more about this as well as other activities. It's really making a lot of progress. Wonderful. We look forward to welcoming you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Talk to you later. So this is Andrew here. Um, I have a comment and a question. So first, uh, nice presentation, uh, both you, uh, Vincent and Brian. So um, just on the one point as far as uh, um, better documentation of the inputs and outputs of each service, um, just a quick note that that was um, is highly related to one of the supplements that we got in the, in the first year between uh, primarily led by Chun Li and Michel de Montier of the Cedar Center. Um, so at whatever point you get to working on that, it, it would be obviously good to, to leverage what they, they built. Um, the second um, uh, the question was, was related to essentially the ongoing maintenance of the metadata records. Uh, the machine learning stuff and the text mining stuff is fantastic, um, but of course uh, there's some there's error proneness and things like that. Um, uh, any thoughts on how you want to engage, you know, actually users in updating the metadata, um, you know, as it changes over time? Uh, yeah, we. we so we, we have we have a, a, a login system and um, we have a, you know a page for for users to be able to edit tools. Um, so yeah, we are considering you know putting putting some trust in the community and, and allowing people to uh, to make corrections as they see fit. Okay. I mean, it might be, you know, since... So, Andrew, it, it, are you recommending we build a specific uh, crowdsourcing interface so people could contribute updating sets? Something well, like I, I mean, I am suggesting that um, community input is, is valuable, um, but of course it's hard to get, right? If you, you know, if you talk to... Um, the model organs and databases have been very active in trying to solicit community input, but it's 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 a hard process. Uh, you know, the the standard sort of contact us button uh, tends not to work. Um, so you know, the thoughts I, I have no special thoughts here, but it, you know, just in the interest of brainstorming, um, you know, I do think that people like um, being empowered to do things and like seeing the immediacy of their changes. So if you are planning sort of just a general login system, you could allow people to essentially make, make changes that would go into sort of a provisional status. And that provisional status, you know, would be immediately displayed, but um, would also be entered into some sort of your metadata curator review, review queue. Um, something like that um, might be an interesting thing to explore. So something like the wiki page tools we're building. I, I guess it is wiki-like, but but again, you know, since you are a sort of a primary data repository, you know, I, I understand also people wanting to know what's been officially blessed versus what has just been, you know, uh, added by a random person three minutes ago. So, you know, well, maybe making those explicit would be one way of, of um, sort of alleviating that concern. Well, yeah, we, we have some, some it, it's a little, the, the tool metadata page, I mean, ha, has a, a lot of blank space. I mean, we could like sort, like sort of source everything 
with like just like a small font, like a footnote or something like that. Um, and then it would either say, you know, like language came from GitHub or language, and then it could say came from user, you know, user so and so, and then with a particular timestamp or something, something like that. Yeah. Or maybe just only if you like mouse over, or there could be like a, you know, like a Wikipedia style footnote or something like that. Yeah, something like that. And, and then showing edit history at the bottom, for example, you know, just say this was edited on, you know, um, July 1st and and so people can see yeah, so the whole page. I wouldn't want an edit history for each field. That would be a little bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. okay. anyway, just, just some ideas to, to, to bat around. Again, I, I don't profess to know the right answer here. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, and, and the one last thought that just also occurred to me, uh, so earlier on you were talking about importing data from all sorts of data repositories and, and, and we've talked with Wei very recently about, you know, obviously uh, importing BioGPS and, and tighter integration there. Um, so one of the things that we get from BioGPS that is a little bit unique is essentially how often tools are used with other tools, right? And it very much speaks to the related resources angle, um, right? I mean, you know, we have this concept of customizable layouts and if two plugins or two resources are used commonly together, well, it suggests that there's some relatedness to there. Um, similarly, I bet you can get similar type of data from by catalog uh, and or my experiments, right? In terms of how users have actually chained these resources together. Um, if, I, I think that could be a very, useful way or a use, another useful way to uh, do your related resources um, f filtering and searching. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll explore uh, more of those options. Yeah, but that's a great idea. Yeah. So, so Andrew, are you thinking of uh, like the PubMed search if we found one article and then immediately there on the right panel, it shows these three articles are related topics that we do the similar things with the tools. Is that what you're Yeah, but I, th I think that there's, uh, you know, the, um, it, the disadvantage, not, I think. It's not the concept of online shopping, you buy something and they'll say customs bought this, also bought, you know, a list. It, it, I'm trying to think how that was ranked versus how the PubMed articles are ranked. Well, actually, I think actually the shopping cart analogy is a really good one, right? On the one hand, right, Amazon, let's just take Amazon. Amazon could do a pure text-based uh, analysis of the product descriptions to uh -huh. say that, you know, what two products are similar. But that doesn't take into account essentially how you know, it doesn't take into account how often people actually buy the same thing together, right? So it could be that, you know, it's, a, it's an idiosyncrasy in uh, the description where, I don't know, it's just getting the relationship wrong, or it could be that the second product is really horrible and therefore people never buy it. Um, and I think the same analogy works here, where as much as you can do similarity based on actually community usage, uh, I think that's a, a useful signal to use. Well, we can sort of explicitly say that, say, you know, okay, tool tool B is a is like a substitute, is like a, a substitute for tool A, and then and then tool C is a complementary tool for tool A to, to sort of categorize the similar tools to clarify which ones would be like a replacement and which ones would be a, like a supplement. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think it's that, that's a tough signal to try to tease out. Um, but but of course it it just takes work to try to tease it out. Um, I, I I think I as a user. Oh, well, so, so that's interesting, right? I mean, you could actually do that uh, type of analysis, right? The complement would be okay. Well, what gets directly used the most with my tool? Right, meaning it could be that uh, tool one chains into tool two. And if you wanted to know which tools were sort of functionally redundant, you wouldn't look at which ones got used together, you would look at what other tools were in common between these two tools. And if they shared a common set of tools, well, maybe they serve a common function. Right. Yeah, maybe you could right. tease it out like that. 
I, anyway, again, I don't know the right answer here. I'm just uh, tossing out uh, ideas uh, for you guys. But you, you, you as a user, Andrew, which, would uh, most of users not knowing the tools would want to use more than one tools for the same data set and to see what information that the best information, comprehensive information they can extract. So it's not necessarily um, replacement tools that wouldn't get used because they share commonalities. Yeah, I mean, I see, I, I see value in sort of both categories of tools, okay. the replacement and the complement. Right. Uh, whether or not I think you we don't have to tease them out. Switch. Yeah, maybe, I think maybe we don't need to tease it out. We just tell them they have some shared features and other features are, are complement to each other. So we don't have to have a separate category. We just say right. they are also related tools. That's probably right. yeah. enough precision there. Um, Right. I, I, I mean, I mostly meant to point out that I think the activity and usage metrics, community usage metrics, when available, I think is is just good signal to incorporate rather than just purely text based. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your all the questions and comments yeah. I have. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so on the uh, updates uh, of the coordination center on you because I missed the steering committee call last week. Uh, so Brian, uh, Vince, and myself are going up north to visit Santa Cruz Center and uh, Cedar Center. And we're going to pitch with them the thing of uh, hosting hackathons in scientific organization conferences of their interest and what we'll get them back to you if there are specifics. Sure, happy to be involved. Um, in the fall, um, visit to the Link Center in Mount Sinai as well as the Link Center in Boston. Um, and the um, and the other um, broad uh, Howard Medical School Center. So quite a few of them, I think seven or eight of them are all scheduled that to be completed by the end of September. That was part of our um, deliverables in the coordination center. So we just finished the scheduling yesterday. So we'll send you a schedule the way we're doing it is you guys are very welcome to join um, on any of the trips. And if you do, the coordination center will pay for the travel. Sounds great. Um, just definitely in let me um, you know what the, the schedule looks like. OK. Uh, so. Coming on July 25th, there's a preliminary draft of agenda uh, online, right? Mm -hmm. And comments and specifics are very welcome. Yeah, so yeah, I, I sent out an email uh, yesterday with, uh, with a preliminary draft of the agenda. So yeah, please take a look at it when you have a chance. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions either now or through email. Um, and I guess another announcement is that, so uh, after after next week's call, we'll be taking a break from the technical calls uh, for the summer and most likely continue uh, in September. Uh, an email will be sent out with more details. Um, so be on the lookout for the email. Uh, I think this is, uh... Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is Salvatore. Um, and uh, so 
I did look briefly at the agenda and uh, also saw the message that Jenny Larkin is coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm wondering um, if either Susan or Jenny, if you want to put in the agenda or at least run it through, run it through them, if they want to give a 10 minute overview of their BD2K vision or their, maybe the Jenny Larkin perhaps can speak on on the Commons on behalf of the Data Science uh, Office, since she's the deputy there. Uh, I don't know. Try, maybe I, I would just try to run a question through through Susan uh, uh, and Jenny whether they they they, they want to have 10, 15, 15 minutes or more uh, in the agenda to to hear their vision on uh, on the overall BD2K. That's a wonderful advice, uh, Salvatore. Definitely, that's uh, that's something we'll do right away. Actually, today, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. If not, uh, yeah. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, That concludes today's conference. Thank you everyone for attending.